All right, so that, this, um, today we're going to talk about, we're going to start with the heart. So we talked about the blood. The blood is what gets carried in the blood vessels. The heart is what pumps the blood through those blood vessels, right? So um, to start, we have to look at the, um, boy, we really need a better lamp on there. Um, I've not replaced the lamp yet, so I'm going to have to, this is really dark, I apologize, but we're going to, I'm going to have to call them today because they're not responding to email. All right, hopefully we can see what's going on. So we have um, the heart, and the heart has, there's actually the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart uh, are going to work together, but the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs, and then it comes back again to the heart, and we call that the pulmonary circuit. So when the right side of the heart pumps the blood to the lungs, and then it comes back to the heart, that's called the pulmonary circuit. The left side of the heart, that's going to pump the blood to all the tissues in your body, and then it's going to come back again to the heart, and we call that the systemic circuit. Right? So a big clue is if you ever hear a blood vessel that has pulmonary in the name, that's part of the pulmonary circuit. That's going to or from the, the lungs from the heart. Um, if it has, doesn't have pulmonary in it, chances are that it is a systemic artery or vein, right? So um, that is uh, just kind of showing you the differences between the pulmonary and systemic circuit. All right, so here's the heart, um, and the heart sits in the area that we call the mediastinum. So if you remember, when we went back to the cavities, we had the two pleural cavities, right? So those are where the lungs are. And then we had the pericardial cavity. So the heart is in the pericardial cavity, meaning there's the pericardium, that serous membrane that surrounds it. But the pericardial cavity is in this area here. The whole area in between the lungs is a space that's called the mediastinum. So the pericardial cavity is in the, in the mediastinum. Some of the other things that are in the mediastinum are these major blood vessels that come off of the heart. Okay, so that's um, where the, the heart sits. And we can see that the heart comes to a little um, tip at the bottom. So where it comes to a tip, we call that the apex. And then we look at the top of the heart where those major blood vessels come off of, and it looks really flat. And that is called the base of the heart. Bless you. All right. So um, when we look at this picture here, we can see that serous membrane that we call the pericardium. So the pericardium, there's a visceral pericardium. That's the one that's going to cover the heart. So it's really close, tight to the heart. And then there's an outer layer that kind of lines the cavity. And that's called the parietal pericardium, right? And the space in between those two is filled with a serous fluid so that when the heart beats and when it expands and contracts, um, it can do that. That fluid allows it to do that without causing any friction against anything in that, um, that space in there. So it's not going to have friction against the lungs. It's not going to, it's not going to cause any friction. It can just flu it very easily and smoothly contract and expand. This is showing a picture of um, if you put your fist in a balloon, it just illustrates um, the fist would be the heart, and the area of the balloon that is close to the fist, that's called, that would be the visceral pericardium. And then the layer of the balloon that's farther away, that would be the parietal pericardium. And the air in the balloon, that would be the serous fluid, okay, that would allow that to, um, it would reduce friction. This is where the heart kind of sits in the chest cavity if we look at the ribs. So we look at the base of the heart, it's up at about the second rib, and it goes down to about the fourth or fifth rib. And we can see that it sits off a little further towards the left side. So it's going to take up a little more space in the left side than it is in the right. This is a picture of the heart that you see um, from the outside. So there's major anatomical features on the um, front of the heart, and then we'll turn it around so you can see the back of the heart. First of all, the heart is made up of four chambers. 
Chambers are opening, they're clearings, you know, they're, they're cavities inside the heart. And so there's two on top, those are called the atria. We have the right atrium and the left atrium. Okay, those are the two cavities um, on the top of the heart. On the bottom of the heart, we have the ventricle. We have the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So you're seeing where they are. You're not seeing the cavities. You're not seeing the openings inside. You're just seeing the front of them um, where they would be. Okay. The atrium, if you look at them, you can see that the atrium have this um, little wrinkled appearance on there. We call those the oracles. So the oracle of the right atrium and the oracle of the left atrium. And they're wrinkled like that just so that when the atrium fill up with blood, they have the opportunity to expand. Okay? Um, so they, they have that little bit of wrinkling. Um, we can see where the atrium and the ventricles are separated from each other just by looking at the outside of the heart. You can't see the actual wall, the muscle wall that separates them, but you can see this little indentation here. This is called the coronary sulcus. And the coronary sulcus will actually go all the way around the heart from the front to back, separating the atrium from the ventricles. So we look at this picture, and we can see it on the back side. The coronary sulcus always separates the atrium from the ventricles. Okay. Inside that, yes? What did you say the um, wrinkles were for on the back side? To allow for expansion when it fills with blood. Yep. If I go too fast, let me know. Okay. Okay, so inside the coronary sulcus, we see fat and blood vessels in there. All right, so that's what you're going to see, too, when you do your dissection. Okay. Um, you're going to see some fat in those areas, and you're going to see um, some blood vessels. Sulcus, that means like a shallow depression. So this is a shallow depression that's filled with fat and blood vessels. This fat is there for um, protection? Yeah, or... protection. Yep. Um, what is the coronary sulcus again? The atrium and the ventricle. Okay. Okay. Um, then we also see these other um, these other indentations. Here's one that separates the right and the left ventricle on the front of the heart. So we call that the anterior interventricular sulcus. Very descriptive. Anterior means it's on the front of the heart. Interventricular means it's in between the right and the left ventricle. Sulcus means it's a shallow depression. So the anterior interventricular sulcus. And if we look at the back of the heart, we see the same thing. There's another indentation that shows us the separation between the ventricles. Um, and this is called the posterior interventricular sulcus. Okay? And again, it's filled with fat and blood vessels. And those, all those blood vessels are going to feed and supply oxygen and nutrients to the um, heart muscle tissue itself. All right, so now we're going to look at some of the major blood vessels that we see um, on the base of the heart. Right, so if we look up here, we can see these major blood vessels. When you're looking at the heart from the front, the one that's going to be most anterior is this one. This is called the pulmonary trunk. Okay. When we open the heart up, we're going to see that the pulmonary trunk is coming from the right ventricle. Okay. Uh, then right behind that, um, and, and the pulmonary trunk, um, it's pretty short, and then it divides right away and divides into two pulmonary arteries. One pulmonary artery is the left. This one's the left pulmonary artery. That's going to go to the left lung. And then the other branch, which you can't see because it's behind this vessel, that would be the right pulmonary artery, and that's going to the right lung. Okay. The big vessel right behind the pulmonary trunk is called the aorta, the aorta. And the aorta is actually coming from the left ventricle. Okay? It's coming from the left ventricle. So here's the aorta. It's actually coming from the left ventricle. When we open the heart up, we'll be able to see that a little bit easier. Okay? And then we have, we see this major blood vessel up here. This is called the superior vena cava. The superior vena cava is going into the right atrium bringing blood into the right atrium. 
Now we're going to look at the back of the heart. So you can see these blood vessels back here. So um, up at the top there, this blue vessel, you can see that um, that where the pulmonary trunk divided, and we have the left pulmonary artery where it divided right here, and we see the right pulmonary artery right there. Okay. Also on the back, you can see that superior vena cava going into the right atrium. You can also see the inferior vena cava going into the right atrium. Okay. And the last major blood vessels that you see, here is the left atrium. Coming into the left atrium are these veins that are coming back from the lungs. So here are the two left pulmonary veins. They're coming from the left lung. And here we see the two right pulmonary veins, and they're coming from the right lung. Okay. Okay, so we'll look at the inside of the heart um, in just a sec. I first want to show you the um, heart muscle tissue. This is going to be a diagram that you're going to have on your lab exam. This is showing the muscle wall. So you're seeing the whole muscle wall here. It curves this way. So this is actually the cavity, the inside of the heart. And this would be the inner layer of the heart right here. So this inner layer right here is called the endocardium. Endo means inside. Cardium means the heart, inside the heart. The thick middle layer here, that's filled with the contractile um, cells of the heart, the muscle cells of the heart, and that is called the myocardium, myocardium. And then we have the outer layer of the heart, and the outer layer of the heart is right here. Um, that is called the epicardium, and the epicardium and the visceral pericardium are the same thing. The epicardium and the um, visceral pericardium are the same thing. And then you see that space where the fluid is, and then you see the parietal pericardium. Okay? So those are the layers. You'll have to know endocardium, myocardium, and epicardium on the lab exam. All right, so here we see the inside of the heart. And so there's some structures that I want to go over with you on the inside of the heart. And then we're going to do a little bit of a drawing so that you guys um, can, can figure out the flow of blood through the heart, right? Because blood will only flow in one direction. All right, so first, um, let's start by looking at the right atrium. So here's the right atrium. The right atrium, you can see, is receiving blood. Um, there's the superior vena cava, here's the inferior vena cava. So inside the right atrium, we see the opening for the superior vena cava, and we see the opening for the inferior vena cava. Okay? We also see an opening going into the right ventricle. Okay? So there's a hole between the right atrium and the right ventricle. The other thing we see inside the right atrium is this it looks like a hole that... Um, has been filled in. It's been healed over, and there's tissue over it now. So when um, when it was a, when it was actually open, that's when um, the baby was still developing inside the mother's womb, and it was an actual hole um, that went between the right atrium to the left atrium. So there was blood mixing between the right and the left atrium, and when it was a hole, it was called a foramen. So it was the foramen ovale. Was a hole in the heart. By the time the baby was born, that was healed over, and then we see a remnant of it, and that's called a fossa. So it went from a foramen to a fossa, and so that's called the fossa ovalis. <coughs> okay, um, so that's the right atrium. Now, when the right atrium, um, when the blood in there, it's going to it's going to move through the opening into the right ventricle. 
So now we're going to talk about the right ventricle. First thing we see, there are these valves in there. Those valves on the right side are called tricuspid valves. Tricuspid valves. So tri has an R in it, so tricuspid is on the right side of the heart. Okay? Tricuspid valves. Tri because it has three cusps in it. That's why they named it tricuspid. Three cusps. Okay? So those tricuspid valves are held down by these cords. And these cords are called chordae tendinae. Chordae tendinae. Okay. Chordae. So it's, it's holding the valves down to the muscle inside the ventricle. Okay. So we look at the muscle in the ventricle, and the, all those cords are being held down to this particular muscles in here that are called capillary muscles capillary muscles. And what that does, what those structures do, is it keeps those valves open. So those valves are going to stay open until there's enough pressure in the ventricle, and then the blood will push up against those valves and close them. <coughs> okay? So the chordae tendinae hold those valves open, but if the ventricles contract, then those valves are going to close. <coughs> okay, now, with all that pressure, when the ventricles contract, if those valves close, blood can never go back into the right atrium. But it has to go somewhere. So blood then will flow out through that pulmonary trunk. So blood flows through into the pulmonary trunk. There's another valve at the base of the pulmonary trunk. And we look at that valve, and it looks more like half moon. So we call it a semi-lunar valve. It just has a little bit different structure than the cuspid valves. Right? So the semi-lunar valves will be open, and blood will flow into the pulmonary trunk. Now, the more the, the blood flows into the pulmonary trunk, the greater the pressure becomes in the pulmonary trunk. And then the ventricles relax. Now the pressure is greater in the pulmonary trunk, and the blood, as it slips back, is going to close those semilunar valves. So blood will never backflow into that ventricle. So then blood is in the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk divides into the pulmonary arteries. The blood's going to go to the right lung and the left lung. Okay? So blood flows to the lungs. At the lungs, the blood is going to pick up oxygen. Okay? So when it's picking up oxygen, um, the hemoglobin grabs onto the oxygen, and now the blood becomes bright red. As it was going to the lungs, the blood was deoxygenated. It didn't have enough oxygen. The hemoglobin didn't have enough oxygen to make it bright red, and so the blood was darker. The purple, blue, right? But it goes to the lungs, and it picks up oxygen, and then it's going to return to the left side of the heart, right? So it's going to return um, from the left lungs. It's going to return through the two left pulmonary veins, and from the right lung, it's going to return by the two right pulmonary veins. Okay. And those pulmonary veins go into the left atrium. So blood's coming back from the lungs to the left side of the heart. All right, now in the left atrium, um, there's an opening going down into the left ventricle. So the blood will flow from the left atrium down into the left ventricle. Right, so now we look at the left ventricle. There are valves um, in between the atrium and the ventricle, um, and those are called the bicuspid valve. So the bicuspid valve is on the left side of the heart. Another name for that is the mitral valve. Mitral valve. Okay. Those bicuspid valves are held open. There's chordae tendinae holding those valves down to the papillary muscles, and it keeps those valves open. And the valves will close 
when the ventricles contract and there's pressure pushing those valves up and closing them. Okay. And when the ventricle contracts hard enough, the blood has to go somewhere. So it's going to go out through this opening here into the, atri into the um, aorta. So the blood will leave the left ventricle and go into the aorta. It's never going to go backwards. It should never go backwards. It should never come back into the ventricle. Or the ventricle, the ventricular blood should never go back into the atrium. The aortic blood should never go back into the ventricle. It should never flow backwards. Um, there's another valve here at the base of the aorta. You can't see it um, on your picture in your book. You'll be able to see a tiny little half moon. You can kind of see it there. That's part of the valve. It's a semilunar valve. It's called the aortic semilunar valve. It's the same thing. Um, when the ventricle contracts, blood moves into the aorta. As more blood moves into the aorta, the pressure builds and builds and builds. The ventricles relax, and because of the pressure in the aorta, the blood starts to come back, and that shuts those semilunar valves. It shuts them. Okay, so that's our path. Our path is going to be blood comes into the right atrium, crosses through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, goes out through the semilunar, the pulmonary semilunar val uh, valves into the pulmonary trunk, splits into the right and left pulmonary arteries, goes to the lungs, picks up oxygen, comes back to the left side of the heart. Through the left pulmonary veins and the right pulmonary veins, they're bringing back oxygenated blood to the left atrium. That flows down through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. Then blood is going to flow through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta. And then the aorta is going to deliver that blood to all the tissues in the body. Okay. All right, so let's do a little drawing. So I'm going to draw the right side of the heart in blue. I'm going to draw, and so this is the right atrium. And this is the right ventricle. Okay. I'm going to draw the left side of the heart in red. The left atrium and the left ventricle. Okay. Should be the same size. <laughs> okay, so first we're going to start with the right atrium. So we said there's two blood vessels coming into the red right atrium, major blood vessels. What did we say they were? The vena cava. So we have the superior vena cava right here. And we have the inferior vena cava right here. Okay, They're blue. They're bringing into the right atrium deoxygenated blood. So this blood is coming from the body. The cells in the body used the oxygen. Now the blood has to come back. To the heart, boy, it's kind of hard for you guys to see that, that stupid lamp. Okay, so they're coming back to the heart, deoxygenated. Now the blood is going to move into the right ventricle, and it has to pass through a valve. What's the name of that valve? That's called the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid valve, right? Then the blood um, 
is going to flow out through another major blood vessel. What is that called? Pulmonary trunk. So there's our pulmonary trunk. Blood's going to flow out that way. And then there's another valve down there. What's the name of that valve? Yep, what's the name of this vessel? Pulmonary. So it's the pulmonary semilunar valve, right? So that pulmonary semilunar valve. Okay? Pulmonary semilunar valve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's going into the, this is the pulmonary trunk. So to this point, it's still the oxygen. Yep, still the oxygen. It can only pick up oxygen in the lungs. That's the only place it can pick up oxygen, right? So then the pulmonary trunk is going to split. Okay, it's going to split into the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery okay. right pulmonary artery is going to go to the right lung Left pulmonary artery is going to go to the left lung. So this is the right lung. This is the left lung. And the blood is flowing into the lung. Flows into the lung. All right, so what do we pick up in the lung? Oxygen. oxygen. We're breathing oxygen in. We're going to pick up oxygen. Now the blood's going to be... Now it's going to be bright red, right? So um, we are going to have, from the left lung, there will be two blood vessels coming back to the left atrium. Those are called the left pulmon um, pulmonary veins. And we have two blood vessels coming back from the right lung. <coughs> And those are called the right pulmonary veins. Okay, so we got the left and the right pulmonary veins. And they're bringing back bright red oxygenated blood. Okay, so now that bright red blood is going to flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle. Okay, and it has to go through a valve. There's our valve. What's the name of that valve? That is the bicuspid valve, otherwise known as the mitral valve, commonly known as the mitral valve. Right? When they have alternating valves, do they replace the valve or do mm -hmm. they just like depends on what they need. They either repair it or they replace it. They'd have to use other tissues in the body to replace it. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, then, so now the blood is in the left ventricle. Now the, now the blood is going to leave through this major blood vessel that we call the aorta. So that comes up like that, right? So this is the aorta, right? And the blood's going to flow into there. It has to cross through this valve. What's the name of that valve called at the base of the aorta? Yep, that is the aortic semilunar valve. Okay. Aortic semilunar valve. Okay, and then this is going to go to all the tissues in the body. So if we go back and we look at our path here, okay, go back and look at the 
the superior and inferior vena cava. The superior vena cava is draining blood. This is coming from the tissues of the head. Okay, the head, the arms, the chest. Okay, so that's draining into the superior vena cava and then into the right atrium. The inferior vena cava, this blood is coming from the abdomen, the pelvis, and the legs. Right? So the blood's flowing into the right atrium, then into the right ventricle, then into the pulmonary trunk, then to the lungs, and it picks up oxygen. Then it flows from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, into the aorta, and in the aorta, the aorta is going to deliver this blood through several different branches, but it's going to deliver the blood to the tissue. So it's delivering the oxygenated blood to the head, arms, and chest, and it's delivering the oxygenated blood to the abdomen, pelvis, and legs. And that's where it drops off the oxygen. Right? So it'll drop off the oxygen. Now the blood doesn't have oxygen anymore. Now it's blue. Now it goes back to the right side of the heart, deoxygenated. So it's a closed circuit. We go from the heart to the lungs, back to the heart, from the heart to the tissues, back to the heart. Heart to the lungs, back to the heart. Heart to the tissues, back to the heart. And it's a closed circuit. Okay? The blood never leaves the blood vessels. Oxygen will leave the blood vessels. Nutrients will leave the blood vessels. Wastes will enter the blood vessels. But all those red blood cells, they're going to stay inside those blood vessels. They're not going to leave. All right? So that's the closed circuit that we have. When the heart contracts, does it does it do like one part and then the other, or when it contracts, it goes like all the way? So when the heart contracts, it'll be the two atriums and then the two ventricles. So you get, you'll get a like a lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Okay. So we're going to talk about the heart sounds in just a minute. It says atrium and then ventricles, atrium and then ventricles. Okay. So let's look then. So that's the flow of blood through the heart. Um, here's a picture just showing the uh, chordae tendinae, so you can see what they look like, and the papillary muscles that are holding them down. Um, now here's an interesting picture. This is showing the muscle tissue. We did a cross-section um, of the ventricles. This is the left side of the heart, and we can see how thick the left ventricular walls are compared to the right ventricle. And we saw that in our, di in our dissection, right? You saw how thick the left walls of the, vent the left ventricle are? Why? Why is the left ventricle thicker than the right? It's the right. You go back and look at that drawing that we just made. The left ventricle has to push that blood to all the tissues in the body. So it has a lot farther to go. Where does the right ventricle push the blood to? The lungs. The lungs a pretty short distance, right, from the heart. So that's why the left ventricle uh, is much thicker. This is showing a picture of the valves when they're open, just so you can get an idea of what they look like when those valves are open. Okay, and um, what we're seeing here is that the pulmonary valves are closed. So when the pulmonary valves close, they're going to close at the same time. Okay, the, 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 um, the, and the semilunar valves. When the pulmonary and aortic semilunar valves are closed, they close at the same time. And then the tricuspid and bicuspid valves will close at the same time. They open at the same time. So semilunar valves close and open at the same time. Cuspid valves close and open at the same time. Okay, we're going to switch gears just a little bit, and we're going to talk about um, the heart tissue itself. So we just talked about all the major blood vessels and the pathway of blood through those major blood vessels. Now I want to show you the blood vessels that supply the
the muscle of the heart. So the heart is a tissue. It, the muscle tissue itself needs oxygen and nutrients. So the blood's going to supply that. Those blood vessels we call the coronary vessels. Coronary vessels. So, um, which major blood vessel actually um, do you think has the highest oxygen content? Can you look up there. Which which one is going to have the highest oxygen content? The aorta, right? So the aorta has a lot, a lot of um, oxygen, right? So at the base of the aorta, we see the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. That's coming off of the aorta, okay? So it's got nicely oxygenated blood, and the right coronary artery is going to supply the right side of the heart with oxygen and nutrients, and the left coronary artery is going to supply the left side of the heart with um, oxygen and nutrients. Um, they branch off. Uh, for our lab, we don't need to know those branches, but, you know, um, when the left coronary branch uh, artery does branch, one of them is going to move around to the back side of the heart. The other one's going to go down through that anterior interventricular um, sulcus. Okay. Then um, we see the right coronary artery, and it also is going to branch off. Now those arteries, arteries become eventually become capillaries, and then capillaries merge back together to become veins. Okay, so they, they just merge together. Um, so after the blood is delivered by the arteries, those arteries are going to become veins, and the blood's going to come back through the right atrium. So there's a couple of coronary veins that you have to know, two of them actually. Um, one of them starts in the anterior interventricular sulcus. That's called the great cardiac vein. And then it comes up and it wraps around that coronary sulcus and it goes to the back of the heart. And on the back of the heart then, that great cardiac vein drains into this enlarged area of vein, which is called the coronary sinus. And then the coronary sinus drains into the right atrium. So the right atrium is actually receiving deoxygenated blood through the superior vena cava, through the inferior vena cava, and then through that coronary sinus, okay? And veins drain into this coronary sinus. We have the great cardiac vein draining into the coronary sinus, and then we have the middle coronary vein draining into that coronary sinus as well, middle cardiac vein. So great cardiac vein, middle cardiac vein, they drain into that coronary sinus. And then the coronary sinus drains into the right atrium. Okay? All right. So those are just some coronary vessels that you have to be able to identify. So why are the coronary vessels important? Well, let me show you. In any blood vessel, when the blood vessel is clear of debris, you get a nice flow of blood, and so then that vessel is going to be able to deliver oxygen and nutrients, right? But if you ever have any type of atherosclerotic placking, you know, you're going to see the placking stick to the wall of the blood vessel, and we look at the diameter of the blood vessel, and it cuts it about in half. So now that muscle tissue will be getting about half the amount of blood that it would normally get, right? And um, we're going to learn in the next chapter how, how much impact the diameter of the blood vessels actually have on delivering blood. But what that means to the heart, then, is that um, in a normal heart, you're going to get a normal perfusion of blood throughout the tissue, meaning there's nothing impeding the blood flow, so all of those muscle tissues of the heart are going to receive blood like they should. So they're receiving the right amount of oxygen, the right amount of glucose, right? This picture is showing a heart that has advanced artery disease, coronary artery disease. So there's a lot of placking on these vessels. Those vessels are not receiving a good perfusion of blood. They're not getting enough oxygen. They're not getting enough glucose, okay? And when they don't get the nutrients and the oxygen, the tissue dies. If enough tissue dies, then you have heart failure, okay? So that's why um, those keeping those coronary vessels open, keeping all of those coronary vessels open is so important. 
that's where they put stints in. So sometimes if, a, if they, they have blockage, um, they can do a couple of things depending on how severe the blockage is. They could put a little collar inside the blood vessel, which is called a stint, to keep it open. Or they might do a bypass where they, they take the, um, you know, they take a, a blood vessel and bypass where it's been blocked to bring blood from another artery to that area. Okay. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to talk about a couple more things, um, and then we'll be done. All right. Okay, so we'll finish up with the chapter. Um, we got a 20, 25 minutes. Um, all right, so. Okay, so the, um, the heart muscle tissue has these cells that are called contract, right? So they cause the contraction. Contraction of the atrium, contraction of the ventricles, and they push the blood through the heart. There's also some specialized cells, though, that the heart has, some specialized muscle cells that are called the conducting system. Right? So this is a, a group of um, cells called the conducting system. And so what they're going to do is they're going to um, generate action potential. And so they're going to tell the atrium when to contract, and they're going to tell the ventricles when to contract, right? Um, so uh, what we know is that the heart can um, beat, uh, it has a rhythm and a rate, and it beats all on its own. It's involuntary. And that's because of these pacemaker cells. It's because of this conducting system so that the heart can do that. We also know that the brain, especially the medulla oblongata, um, can affect the heart, right? It can affect the heart and change the rate of um, contraction. But the heart can contract on its own. It has its own rate and rhythm all on its own. So these are the components of the conducting system. First, we have this, this pacemaker here. Um, these cells are in a node. We call this a node. It's the sinoatrial node. So on your lab exam, <coughs> You cannot put SA node, which is what we usually call it, the SA node. You'd have to write out sinoatrial node. From the sinoatrial node, um, these action potentials are going to travel through these cells going to this other node called the atrioventricular node. Okay. So the SA node is in the right atrium. And the AV node, like the name says, atrial ventricular, it's going to be between the atrium and the ventricle. That's the location of them. Inside the cells or directly? They're inside the cells. They are inside um, the muscle cells. Okay. All right. So the um, sinoatrial node, then the pathways that are leading from the SA node to the AV node, those pathways are called internodal pathways because they're going between the SA node and the AV node. And they're carrying action potentials. So as they're carrying the action potentials, the muscle cells of the atrium are going to contract. And the right atrium and the left atrium contract at the same time. Now the SA node is sending out 80 to 100 action potentials per minute. 80 to 100 action potentials per minute. Does your heart beat 80 to 100 beats per minute? No. What usually does it beat? Yeah, somewhere between 60 and 70, uh, 65 and 75, somewhere in there, right? So why is it slowing down? It's because, remember that vagus nerve? The cranial nerve, the vagus nerve? The vagus nerve actually influences that SA node. Go back and look at the bottom here. Okay, so 
So here's that vagus nerve coming down, going right to that SA node. What does the vagus nerve do to the SA node? Vagus nerve is part of what nervous system? What part of the autonomic nervous system is it part of? The sympathetic or parasympathetic? Parasympathetic, right? Parasympathetic, the rest and digest. So the vagus nerve is going to tell that SA node, slow down. You don't need to go 80 to 100 action potentials per minute. So it slows it down to what we normally see as 60 to 70 beats minute. So it's a constant supply to that SA node telling it to slow down. You do not need to go so fast, right? All right, so get back here. All right, so we've got these 80 to 100 action potentials per minute, slowed down to 60 to 70, and they're traveling down here, and then they get to the AV node, and they're going to synapse onto more cells in the AV node. Now, at the AV node, there's a 100 millisecond delay. We need that because we want to make sure the atria contracts first, so the atria depolarize and contract, and then the ventricles depolarize and contract. So it's, there is a 100 millisecond delay here. Okay? Then the action potentials are going to travel down through the AV bundle. Um, those cells are going to split and through the bundle branches and up to the TNG fibers, and then the ventricles are going to contract at the same time. The right and the left ventricles will contract at the same time. Okay? So that's our conducting system. Now, if we look at the SA node, um, I just want to show you the SA node here. This is an action potential from the SA node. This is the um, changes in the membrane potential. So you remember when we were talking about action potentials and we said a cell stayed at resting until it was stimulated by something and then the gates opened up and it started to depolarize? Well, the reason why these pacemaker cells can generate an action potential without any outside stimulus is because the resting membrane potential is unstable. Those sodium gates are open, right? Not just leak channels, but gates are open. Sodium is constantly diffusing in that gradually raising that resting membrane potential so it's going to hit threshold all on its own, all without any type of um, stimulus. Okay? So that's how, that's how the SA node can be a pacemaker, all on its own. All right, so um, what we want to do is talk about the cardiac cycle then. We're going to skip over all the EKG stuff because we're saving that for advanced ANP. And we're going to talk about the cardiac cycle. Right? Cardiac cycle. So the cardiac cycle, um, there's, there's two terms that you need to know. Diastole, that means rest. And systole, that means contract. So we've got diastole and systole. So what we're going to see is we're going to see there's a time when the atria are resting, so they're in, diast they're in diastole, and then we're going to see the atria when they contract, and then they're in systole. So we have atrial diastole, relaxation, atrial systole, that's atrial contraction. We're going to see the same thing with the ventricles. Ventricles are resting, they're in ventricular diastole. Ventricles are contracting, they're in ventricular systole. Right? So we go through these four phases and they overlap a little bit. So we're going to go through and talk about the phases. On this chart, it's a good chart to study. The inside circle here, this inside um, um, edge of the circle, that is the atrium. The outside that is the ventricle, right? So we've got the inside is the atrium and the outside is the ventricle. So we're going to show you one at a time so you can actually see it. Yep? So this is the cardiac cycle, okay? So here you can see it a little bit better, a little bigger. She just wants to know. Okay. The figure number? Yeah, because the... Uh, yep. 
2016. 20 16. Okay? Yep. All right, so here we go. We start in atrial systole. So here's atrial systole. So what does that mean? The atrium is doing what? Contracting. It's contracting. So both of the atriums are contracting. All right? And when that happens, what's going to happen to the blood? It's going to flow from the atrium into the ventricles. The pressure of the atrium contracting push the blood into the ventricles. Are the AV valves going to be open or closed? They're going to be open. So the AV valves, the bicuspid and the tricuspid valves are open so that blood flows down into the ventricles. Right? So that is atrial systole. That's when atrial systole begins. All right? Then um, atrial systole ends and the atria relax. So now we're in atrial diastole right here, right? We start here. So during atrial diastole, the atria are going to, they're, what they're doing is they're going to stop contracting and they're starting to relax. And if we look here, we see at the same time as atrial diastole starts, ventricular systole um, starts as well. So now the ventricles are going to start to contract. Now, um, ventricular systole is a little bit longer than atrial. So ventricular systole is a little bit longer. It's going to have a couple of phases. It's going to have the first part and then the second part of ventricular systole. In the first phase, when the ventricles contract, they're going to have enough pressure that they're going to shut the bicuspid and tricuspid valve. So the pressure in the ventricles, they're contracting, and those valves go and they shut. They just slam shut. And that sound is your first heart sound. When you have lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up, the lub is the pressure from the ventricles contracting and slamming those valves shut. Okay? That's the lub. All right, so that's the first phase. So the, the pressure is building, building, building in the ventricles slams those valves shut. In the second phase, there's enough pressure then to open up the semilunar valve. So now blood is going to flow into the pulmonary trunk and into the um, aorta. So the semilunar valves are open. The cuspid valves are still closed because we want to make sure that blood does not flow back into the atria. So that's um, ventricular systole in the second phase of it. Right now, the next thing that happens after the ventricles are done contracting, they are going to rest. And now we are in ventricular diastole. And if you look, you can see the atria are still in diastole. So now for a long, long way of the cardiac cycle, both the atria and the ventricles are going to relax. Um, until um, we get to atrial systole again. Now, um, the second heart sound the second heart sound is going to come during ventricular diastole. So the ventricles are relaxing. They've already pushed the blood up into the major blood vessels. They've pushed the blood through the semilunar valves, into the pulmonary trunk, into the aorta. And now the ventricles relax. And because the blood was pushed up into those, um, the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, the pressure inside the pulmonary trunk and the aorta builds. So the pressure is building in those two blood vessels. And then the ventricles relaxing, and the pressure in the ventricle drops. So the blood wants to normally flow back towards the ventricle, right? And what that's going to do is it, it's going to shut the semilunar valve. And when those semilunar valves shut, so as blood is flowing backwards, the valves shut so that blood does not come back into the ventricles. And the shutting of those semilunar valves is your second heart sound. So you have lub duck. Lub is the cuspid valves shutting, duck is the semilunar valve shutting. Lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up. 
right? Now, if there's ever a time when um, one of those valves isn't working properly, then we get regurgitation, right? So then what happens is some of the blood from the ventricle might leak back into the atrium. Or some of the blood from the pulmonary trunk or aorta might leak back into one of the ventricles. Shouldn't be doing that. Should only be going one way. And when that happens, if you're using a stethoscope and listening, you might hear a little whoosh sound, right? Because the blood is leaking back. So maybe a lub whoosh dub, lub whoosh dub, a lub dub whoosh, lub dub whoosh. Right? So if you ever have the opportunity to hear that, uh, if the doctor says you want to hear this, it's a, it's a mitral valve prolapse, they might call it, or a heart murmur, they might call it. That's the blood as it's leaking backwards um, through those leaky valves. All right, so that's your cardiac cycle. You do need to know um, what happens during these stages, especially like when the valves close, when they open, um, when the heart sounds are, all right? So make sure you know that. Um, yep. Uh, the atrium, do they um, get empty somehow or they're full? Okay, um, so then let's, yeah, let's finish up with that then. Um, let's see, ventricular diastole. All right, so I think we finished here, ventricular diastole late. All right, so in, in late ventricular diastole, we're in late diastole, um, and we're in, in um, atrial diastole too. So blood is, um, at this point, when both of them are relaxed, blood passively flows into the atria, and then it's going to passively flow into the ventricles, right? So it's just passively flowing. Both the atria and the ventricles are relaxed at this point, and blood flows through. The, the valves are held open because of the chordic tendine, so we get this filling of blood. And then when atrial systole begins again, that's when um, the atria are going to contract and push whatever remaining blood they have in them into the ventricles. Most of the blood that enters into the atrium is just going to drain passively into the ventricles. But when the atria contracts, they'll push that last little bit of blood into the ventricles. Okay? Good. Good. And then we get ventricular contraction, which pushes it out of the ventricles. Okay? Good. All right. So that's the cardiac cycle then. Um, good questions. The last thing I want to talk about then is a little physiology. Okay? Um, these are some factors um, that are affecting. Um, cardiac output, right? So when we hear the term cardiac output, cardiac output is how much blood the left ventricle, so we are just talking about the left ventricle, how much blood does the left ventricle push out every minute? Okay. All right, so um, that means that we would need to look at two things. First of all, we'd have to look at the volume of blood in every heartbeat. How much, how much blood in one heartbeat, in one contraction of the left ventricle is pushed out? So we can measure that. How much blood in one contraction gets pushed out? We can measure that. Then we can measure the heart rate. How many times does that ventricle contract in one minute? Okay. So the amount of blood getting pushed out of the ventricle, the left ventricle, in one heartbeat, that is called the stroke volume, stroke volume. And then how many times the left ventricle contracts in one minute, that is called the heart rate. So if we multiply the heart rate times the stroke volume, that gives us the cardiac output. That tells us how much blood that left ventricle is pumping out every minute. Now, we can look and say there are some factors that affect both of those things. They can affect your cardiac output, we can affect the heart rate, or we can affect the stroke volume. Both of those things can influence the cardiac output. So we look at the factors affecting the heart rate. Let's look at autonomic innervations. So now we're looking at the autonomic nervous system. Which nervous system 
could actually speed up the heart rate. Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Sympathetic, right? So if a person's under a lot of stress, that's going to increase their heart rate. If we increase the heart rate, we're going to do what to cardiac output? We're going to increase the cardiac output, right? Which, um, nerve, which part of the autonomic nervous system will slow it down? Parasympathetic, right? So parasympathetic innervation will decrease the heart rate, will slow the heart rate down, which will decrease the cardiac output, right? We also have hormonal influence over the heart rate. You guys, can you think of any hormones that might increase the heart rate? Okay, so the adrenal medulla puts out norepinephrine and epinephrine, right? That could um, increase the heart rate. Um, any other ones that you can think of? Thyroid. The thyroid gland could increase the heart rate. It increases metabolism. It's going to increase the heart rate. So those are some uh, hormonal influences on the heart rate. Then we look at the stroke volume. And when we look at the stroke volume, we have to look at some other terms that aren't in your notes that are going to seem a little unfamiliar. We're going to think through it. There's the end diastolic volume, and there's the end systolic volume. Again, we're talking about the left ventricle. So when would we be measuring for the end diastolic volume, when do you think we would measure the amount of blood in the ventricle? At the end of its rest period or at the end of its contraction period? Rest. rest. At the end of its rest period. So the amount of blood in the left ventricle end of its rest period, when it has as much blood as it can have before it pumps it out, that's called the end diastolic volume. So you're, that's as full as it's ever going to get. So if you have a high end diastolic volume, do you think you're going to have a higher cardiac output or a lower cardiac output? High. You're going to have a higher cardiac output because you have more blood to push out. Okay. okay. Then the ventricle, the left ventricle, contracts and pushes out um, as much blood as it can. And there's still some blood left in there after it contracts. That is called the end systolic volume, right? That's the end systolic volume. <coughs> Do you think the cardiac output is going to be greater if the end diastolic volume is bigger or smaller? Bigger. Smaller. The more it can push out, that means the, the, the more, the less that's in the ventricle at the end of contraction, that means the more it's pushed out. <coughs> so our stroke volume, um, the amount of blood that the ventricle pushes out is going to be the amount of the end diastolic volume minus what's left over, the end systolic volume. We can't measure the blood in the pulmonary trunk. And we can't measure the um, blood in the aorta. All we, we can measure the blood in the left ventricle. So we take how much it started with and subtract how much it ended up with, and that tells us how much it pushed out. Right? How do you measure that? Do you have to do some sort of test for um, you to just hear it? You can't really yeah, hear they, it, they measure it. Um, um, you know, I'll have to, I'll do some, a little bit of research on that. Yeah, they, they can do it a couple of different ways with, like, dye. So they're looking, um, you know, they're taking imaging of some sort of dye. Image. Yes, yep, so they can measure it that way. Okay, um, so this will help you. Um, there's two, actually two um, case studies on Chapter 20 that you guys need to work on um, in the <coughs> Do you see when the due date is on that? Is it is it due Friday already? All right, so work on those because you're going to turn those in on Friday. Make sure you have your answers all written out and typed up. Okay, make sure, come on, you have the right one. Okay, all right, so chapter 20, there's two of them for chapter 20. All right, and that's it. I'm going to you know, open up the lab at about... Um, 10.50. Actually, I'm going to go over there now and open it up. You guys can go in there when you want and start looking at the lab model for the heart. So you said that